What's up, Internet? Seriously, Nathan here, and it's time for a new episode of Throne Watch. Throne Watch is, of course, the show where we talk about the most recent episode of Game of Thrones. We're on Season 6, Episode 6, and before we move forward into this big ol' spoiler warning, because we're going to be talking about pretty much everything that happens in the episode. So, let's get started. First off, we open up with Bran getting dragged away from the remnants of the place where he was earlier. You know, the one where Hodor died last episode? Yeah, he's getting pulled away from there, and he's having his visions and stuff, and so we're starting to learn really what the Three-Eyed Raven is at this point in time. The Three-Eyed Raven is the guy with all of the knowledge of the world in, in kind of a weird way. He doesn't know everything, but he knows most things, and he knows the history of the world. And now Bran is that guy, so he's seen all of these different things that are happening, and he knows that they're getting chased, and he finally wakes up and is like... They found us, they know exactly where they where we are. But they get saved by a mysterious figure who, if you see the episode, I think it's actually fairly obvious who it is, but it, it's not actually revealed till the end, so we'll get there when we get there. But it's actually kind of a short scene, so that's pretty much all that happens there. The really the only big takeaway from that is that we learn a little bit more about Rhaegar Targaryen and how he was as as a king or was it i don't know if it was Rhaegar so much as just the targaryen kings and that they killed a lot of people while they were on the throne and so it kind of makes a lot more sense why they got deposed that's actually the kind of more interesting thing and there's a hint back towards the tower of joy so i think we're going to learn more about that coming a little bit later this season too next up we get to sam and gilly oh man sam and gilly i love these characters they're so endearing because they are such just normal people and it, it feels good to have this contrast between these like royal and you know these up there high class people and like Sam and Gilly who are normal people even though we learn that Sam is not normal he's I mean his family's like crazy rich because we meet them this episode and it's really interesting seeing the dynamic between not only Sam and his family but also now Gilly and how how sweet his mother and his sister are and how much of a total jerk his dad is and we learn really about why Sam left and why he, you know, feels so uncomfortable around his family and his dad and everything like that. It's really interesting to see Sam put in this position because we all know that Sam is a hero, right? We know that he's a brave dude, but even when confronted with his father, you know, that bravery can't come out because Sam just can't handle his dad because he's so terrified of him. Uh, and so it's really interesting to see Sam go through these emotions over the course of this and Gilly really being like kind of the strong one in the scenario whereas previously she's been kind of the, the weaker half of that couple and in the end they end up just leaving because Sam is being sent away his father will not ha let him stay here and even though he hates his wildling bride or he uses other words for that uh, he was gonna let her stay but Sam's like you know what it, we we belong together we're not gonna be separated out we're gonna stick together and so you're coming with me even if women aren't supposed to be with the maesters it, it's really telling that Sam even though he's not brave in, in most of the scenario at the end he's still willing to do what is necessary also he steals his dad's Valyrian steel sword now Valyrian steel is a pretty important concept because Valyrian steel is one of the few things that can beat White Walkers as seen when Jon Snow using his Valyrian steel sword killed a White Walker and there are very few Valyrian steel weapons left in the world and so this is one of them so this is a big setup for Sam and it's it's a lot of foreshadowing that Sam is going to be kind of at the forefront of this White Walker confrontation that arrives probably next season probably season seven uh, we will see a lot of White Walker confrontation and Sam is going to be a very important role if only because he has this sword but he's gonna be more important because of you know because he's Sam, and everyone loves Sam. Next time we move to Tommen and Marguerite. Tommen is confronting the High Sparrow, and the High Sparrow finally lets him talk to Marguerite. They talk about how they didn't anticipate the High Sparrow being like he was. Really, that's all that happens in this moment, except that we really are beginning to learn a little bit more about Tommen, and 
how much he really does care. And it, it still makes me feel so sad because I know that Tommen has to die by the end of the show. And now I don't want him to because I like him. But he's most certainly going to die. And this is just kind of endearing us to both Tommen and Marjorie. And also a setup for a little bit later in the episode. Next on, we move to Arya Stark, or the Faceless Girl, as we should probably approach her by. She's watching that play. Remember that last episode she was tasked with killing the main actress of this play? And she's watching this play... And all of the actors in it are terrible. Really, they're all bad actors. It's interesting because they're good at the, the actual physical, real life actors are good actors for portraying bad actors. But we see that the, the actress that she's supposed to kill is a, actually a very good actress and puts a lot of emotion into her performances. And Arya's kind of feeling bad because it's like, I have to kill this lady. So she goes in and poisons the wine. But then as she's walking out, she meets the actress. And at first, it's kind of this interesting moment of this actress kind of seems like a jerk at first, but as we get to learn a little bit more about her, just a very short period of time, I'm talking like three minutes of time, we learn a ton about this actress, and that she's actually super nice and super sweet, and she's just kind of hardened by the world a little bit. And when this happens, Arya has a change of heart. Arya knows, doesn't actually know, she wasn't told, but she figured out who wants to kill this actress. Uh, it's another actress who she sees kind of like eyeing her you know, being all jealous and everything. And so Arya saves this actress's life and warns her saying, you know, she wants to kill you, you know, you need to be careful. And so this completely goes against her no-face teaching and her teaching of the many-faced gods. And so at the end of that, we see, you know, the one girl that we don't like, yeah, she's gonna go try to kill Arya now. And Arya goes and gets her sword back, which was her kind of abandoning her Stark heritage. And she is now taking it up. And she's gonna be using what she has learned to better accomplish her goal and in a roundabout way, the goal of all of the Starks. Because what we're seeing now is all of the Starks are in their own way, separately, working towards the same goal. You know, John and Sansa are about to take back Winterfell, and when they take back Winterfell, they're going to be able to defend, better defend the North. Bran is very obviously setting up to defend against the White Walkers. And then now Arya is, she has the, her list of people she plans on killing, and, you know, there are Lannisters on that list. And so they're all working to accomplish the goal of basically resurrecting the Stark name, and they're all doing it separately and in different ways, but they're all working towards the same goal which is super interesting, and we're really seeing a unification of the Stark family, which is kind of what this entire thing is about, honestly. The Stark family is very much the main characters of this show. Their big unification is the big point of this show. So, moving forward, we cut to King's Landing once again. We've just had Tom and Marguerite literally, like, two scenes before. This episode's kind of weirdly cut on scenes, so I'm actually moving around scenes a little bit to better fit with discussion points, because if I were to go actual scene by scene, some of these would have weird cut-ins. It's easier for me to take, like, moments of time more than just scenes. So we cut back to King's Landing where Jamie and the Tyrell army are about to launch their their assault against the Faith Militant. Now remember, uh, last episode, I believe it was, the Lannisters, quote-unquote, and the Tyrells had worked out a thing. They can't let Marjorie walk her walk of atonement. And so now we're starting to see, it was two episodes ago actually, uh, now we're starting to see this plan come to fruition where they're going to use the Tyrell military force to basically force the High Sparrow to give up Marjorie. It's a big show of power, but it's it's not good because the people are on the side of the faith militant. They're on the side of the Sparrow. And so this is kind of a difference between the royalty and the common people which is something which has constantly been a problem for the Lannisters especially. And it's one reason I kind of respect Tommen and Marjorie a little bit more is because they try to care about the, the common people as much as possible. But we learn that the High Sparrow has another trick up his sleeve. Marjorie didn't even have to walk because now Tommen is on the side of the Seven. He's on the side of the Fate. And that's bad because this is literally direct conflict between Jaime slash Cersei and Tommen. You know, now the High Sparrow is getting what he wants which is, you know, obviously pretty bad. And this does not spell out well for the Lannisters. This isn't good. The the Faith Militant is very much their biggest enemy at the moment. And now they have the king just on their side. This just isn't good. And the Lannisters are going to have to rework their strategy. Jaime gets exiled and he gets he's no longer fit to be the king's guard. And so now he's going to go try to take back River Run, which was taken over by the Blackfish because Walder Frey couldn't handle it. 
And so now Jamie has to go do it. And basically, they have to rework their entire plan, both the Tyrells and the Lannisters. And I think they're still going to be working together in the end because they have a similar goal. But they have to rework their entire plan, and we begin to see a little bit of the preface to that uh, between Jamie and Cersei. And, oh man, this was just an intense moment of the High Sparrow is getting what he wants, and the Lannisters need to stop him. I don't like the Lannisters, but they need to stop the High Sparrow because he's obviously got something bad up his sleeve. In the middle of that, we actually cut to Walder Frey, who we just see again for just a few minutes, and he's just talking about how he's just complaining about River Run, and you know what? We still just all hate Walder Frey. Screw him. Nobody likes him. Nobody likes Walder Frey. Next, we move back to Bran Stark again, getting towards the end of the episode here. We get to, we move back to Bran Stark, and he is talking with his, uh, with his savior, is the correct word there. He's talking with his savior about you know, why did you save me? What all this kind of things. It turns out that his savior is Benjen Stark. You remember that guy from like season two who we haven't seen because he went out into the north and he just disappeared all of a sudden, but he, it was never confirmed that he was dead. It, he was most likely dead. Yeah, it's Benjen Stark again. And we learned that Benjen had basically died. He lost to the White Walkers, but then the, the children of the forest saved him. And now he is working to fight the White Walkers and he's working for the Three-Eyed Raven, who is now Bran. And so it's a touching reunion. It's really cool to see Benjen Stark again because the, the downfall of Benjen was kind of the, the beginning of Jon Snow's rise. It's fitting to see Benjen back in the picture. We all liked Benjen originally, and now it's cool to see him again. He's a really fun character. And we just learned a little bit more about the Three-Eyed Raven and, and what his actual eventual goal is uh, in, in defending the North. And it's also kind of an interesting point. There's one other character that I, I think it's worth noting that we did not confirm dead, which is the Hound. The Hound is not confirmed dead. He was left to die, much as Benjen Stark was left to die. So is the Hound going to come back? I don't know. The fact that his brother, the Mountain, also came back, and now Benjen Stark came back, I think it's setting up something nice, and I think the Hound is going to show up at some point. I might be wrong, but I think the Hound is coming back, and I think that this is kind of a, a prelude to that. Finally, we get to our final scene, and it's Daenerys Targaryen. She's leading her Kalasar, and they're walking through and debating, you know, are we going to be able to do this? Are we going to be able to take back Westeros? As this is all playing out, she walks away, or rides away on her horse. She rides away, and everyone's kind of wondering, where is she? Where did she go? And Dario's like, I'm gonna go get her back. And at that moment, the return. Dragon flies overhead, and Daenerys flies down on the back of Drogon, and she has a rousing speech to the Kalasar, and she says, we are going to conquer this world. And that's intense. I mean, Danny, this is it. danny has got her plan. She's going to go back to Marine, save Marine from the problems that have been happening by using the Dothraki, and then she's going to go after Westeros. And of course, last episode we saw, uh, you know, uh, the Greyjoys and what's his face planned on giving a bunch of ships to Daenerys. So there's your goal. We're setting up for the finale, not only of this season, which is going to be the, the conflict at Meereen, the conflict at Winterfell, the conflict in King's Landing. We're not only setting up the finale of this season, but we really are entering, I say this every episode, but we really are entering the finale of the entire show. We're really beginning to get to the end of the entire series, and we're setting up the major conflicts that are going to happen in the end between Daenerys and Westeros, as well as between the Lannisters and the Starks and the Lannisters and everyone else. We're beginning to see these conflicts really come forward, and it is awesome looking. I mean, Daenerys has a huge army, Westeros is in, you know, in complete peril. We're really beginning to see awesome things happening, and oh, I just cannot wait. This this season has been so fantastic, and next season is only going to be better if this all plays out. Not necessarily how I anticipate it, but it's just so cool. Really, the only character I don't really know exactly what's going to happen with yet, as far as predictions, is Arya. Arya is still kind of a wild card right now. Oh, man. So, notable non-inclusions of this episode. There was no John or Sansa, which, you know, they're together, so that's understandable. Uh, and along those same lines, there's no Brienne of Tarth or Tormund. Uh, there was no John, and this is one of the very, very few episodes where there's no John. We've skipped over other characters, uh, characters a lot, but John very rarely gets skipped over. Uh, and so for there not to be any John is interesting. 
Uh, there's also Notarian slash Mirin, you know, Misande and Grey Worm and the new uh, the new Red Lady and, and all of that. There, that was also skipped over. Um, and I th there was also no Boltons, no reference to the Boltons. And I think the reason is, is not so much, it's both to set up the next episode, uh, but it's also, there are so many characters that they have to play around with uh, that they just can't get to all of them. And this fo episode very much focused on Sam and Gilly and uh, Jamie and the Tyrells. It's also because this is one of the few seasons that takes place over a relatively short period of time. Between the beginning of this season and current time, has been maybe seven days, like maybe a week. It has been a very short period of time. Seasons have skipped very long periods of time and told stories over, you know, months and months of time, whereas this one is everything is coming to a head right at the same moment. And so that's why we're seeing this kind of dramatic switch from character to character. There's no real character that we can ignore because everyone has something going on right now. And so that's kind of a lead into this season is coming to a head, and the next season is going to be big. But this episode was awesome. It, it was a ton of fun. Uh, Sam and Gilly's moments were definitely the highlight for me. Uh, seeing Sam's family and everything like that was definitely a big highlight, as well as Jamie and the High Sparrow. Uh, both, all of those moments were, were very good, and uh, it was nice to have a reprieve with Sam and Gilly from kind of the intense action of everywhere else. But anyways, thank you guys for watching this episode of Throne Watch. It was a ton of fun uh, having this episode. And uh, yeah, so be sure to check out Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Tumblr, and of course, Twitch, the five big ones. And you're already on the YouTube one, so that one's pretty easy. Uh, but thanks for checking out. I hope to see you guys soon. I'll see you guys next week for more Throne Watch and over the course of the week for vlogs and also for streams. So have a good night, everybody. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.